Hi, everyone. So this is not a normal thing that happens at RubyConfs, but um, my name is Sam. Um, I'm the track director for the testing track. And uh, I'm actually really pleased Justin is here today because I owe him a huge debt of gratitude. I got very, very ill immediately before RailsConf this year, and I couldn't come and make my talk. And exactly two days before the conference, I texted Justin, who at the time was many, many time zones away. I was like, Justin, listen, there, are, there isn't a backup speaker who can give a testing talk in time. And <laughs> Justin was like, all right, I'll do this. That seems fine. Also, why did you reject my talk in the first place, Sam? <laughs> So I just want to say a huge thanks for Justin for being here. He's definitely having a little bit of a rough week, as I think many of us are. So could we all just give a huge round of applause to Justin and welcome him to the stage? Well, that was touching. Come on, that was, it was touching. That was not an ironic, pithy statement. <laughs> Those are coming. <laughs> All right, let's roll. This talk is called Surgical Refactoring. My real name is Sam Fippen. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't get that joke, you can call me Searles. Uh, that's what my face looks like on the internet. Uh, if you got any feedback from this talk, you can reach me, Justin, at testdouble.com. Uh, that's right, I come from a company called Test Double. Uh, the way that we work at our company is we actually uh, are consultants that work on existing engineering teams to just get a lot of stuff done so that we can create some slack in the system so that we can pay down technical debt, make things better, refactor. Our goal in life is to make the world a better place and make software a little bit less broken for everybody. Uh, if your team could use some of that help, you can say hello at Test Double, uh, and, and we'll set up a call, talk. So this is exciting. Like, there's a national Ruby conference in Ohio, and uh, I live in Ohio, so welcome to Ohio, everybody. Uh, if you live in Ohio, well, welcome to you, too. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, who know me know that I live in Columbus, uh, and so they, they, they expect that I know all about Ohio stuff, but that I'm an Ohioan. I'm not. I'm actually from Michigan. Uh, that's right. I forsook the beautiful, like, awesome landscapes and lakes and everything that, that fill up the memories of my childhood for the rich cultural heritage of Ohio. Uh, this is the Circleville Pumpkin Show. Uh, and, you know, I'm actually not joking. Ohio has culture. I think where I found it best is in its comfort food. Uh, there's a lot of fun stuff, because like, you go to the Circleville Pumpkin Show, and yeah, there's these hilarious, silly pumpkins everywhere, but they also have deep-fried Buckeyes, which are chocolate peanut butter candies, and it's fantastic. Or if that's not your fancy, they have, uh, you know, chocolate-coated, chilled pumpkin cheesecake on a stick. Uh, <laughs> very creative, very, you know, intense culture here. Uh, but it's not just desserts, you know, like no, 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 no cuisine is safe. Uh, these are my, one of my favorite dishes in Columbus, our Ohio nachos. Uh, they are kettle chips covered in queso and sprinkled with breakfast sausage. Uh, it's very hashtag health. Um, <laughs> but it's not because, like, we're into food not because, like, it's, uh, uh, we got great ingredients. As far as I know, all we do is grow corn and animals that eat the corn. Uh, so, so it's not like it's about the ingredients. In fact, it doesn't really matter about the ingredients because we're just going to deep fry it anyway. Uh, this is a grilled cheese sandwich. Uh, it, is, it is a grilled cheese that contains fried uh, cream cheese jalapeno poppers on the inside of it. And then once they build the whole thing, they dunk the sandwich in pancake batter and deep fry that and serve it as a Monte Cristo sandwich. Uh, so that's one of my favorites. That's uh, an example of American exceptionalism right there. Uh, the, <laughs> The other thing about Ohio culture that I've learned since moving here is I feel like Ohioans are really competitive and in the context of food, you know, if there's food and a stopwatch, someone's going to find a way to turn it into a contest. Uh, and, it, and it's something that, that I've learned to, uh, to accommodate in my life. Um, so Monday the, uh, this week, I was just feeling like I just really wanted a good sandwich, so I thought I'd go to the neighborhood deli. I've got a lot of awesome restaurants. They're all in strip malls, and they all have really generic names, but they're really good. So I wanted to go to my neighborhood deli, which, of course, is called Neighbor's Deli. <laughs> and I uh, walked in, and I just noticed for the first time that they actually have a competitive challenge 
sandwich that they make, and you get your money back if you buy it, and you eat the whole thing in 20 minutes. And I was like, all right, well, that's interesting, but you know what? Honestly, uh, I'm better than that. Competitive eating, this is wasteful. Uh, that's, 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 you know, I used to have weight issues. Like, I, that's, that's not something that I'm going to do. I'm just going to get a normal little hot pastrami sandwich. Uh, but then I looked at the list, and I was like, well, you know, they got, they got like, I could sample all the different types of meats, and then I, 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 you might catch this up here. It's like, it's called the monolith. <laughs> And I said, I know a few things about picking apart monoliths. Maybe I can do this. And so then I thought about all of you today, and I didn't want to let you down uh, by, 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 by skipping this challenge. And so uh, this is what got served to me. Uh, zooming out a little bit. Like most monoliths with which we are familiar, uh, it is falling over on itself. And it was not exactly built to spec. Uh, there's like a pound and a half of corned beef at the bottom. Uh, so all of that for less than a grilled cheese in San Francisco. Uh, so what, what did I have to lose? Of course, I looked at that thing and I was like, nope, I'm out. <laughs> but maybe I picked up some Ohio culture because the, the waitress said, all right, 20 minutes, go. And I was like, yeah, I got this. <laughs> so that's me and my sandwich. Uh, and I dove right in, and uh, you know, developers were familiar. We do stupid things under extreme time pressure all the time. I was like, 20 minutes, got, how do I, okay. So I made a huge mess. It was, it was disgusting. It didn't even taste that good, and I was feeling sick. And I knew like, if I pushed any harder, I'd still fail and just be sicker. Uh, so I was like, I'm, I'm going to quit. And there was this elderly lady who'd come in, and she was just watching me, and she said, she said you can do it, <laughs> in a sweet like grandmotherly tone. And I said, I really can't, and I, I shouldn't. And why are you rooting me on? This is unhealthy. And she said, no, we believe in you. <laughs> And she was really serious at that point. She really, I was like, well, I give up, so don't. Um, but I don't know if that is also part of Ohio culture, that there's just this sort of, you know, unjustified faith in others. Um, Sam mentioned it was a rough week for a lot of us, I think. And uh, the reason that I do these conferences, the reasons I'm here today is because I do believe in all of you, and I believe that you can do great things. Uh, so I just wanted to say that before... We got into stuff. Anyway, this is a talk about failing to conquer monoliths. <laughs> so, apropos of nothing. First, let's back up and talk about some context. Um, I love Ruby. Ruby is obviously a super successful, awesome language. Um, if you think about what made what made Ruby successful in the early goings? Everyone's really happy. People were building gems just for fun, uh, just for the, the accolades and the attention you get for being associated with Ruby. Um, and the thing about languages is that the early days of success are determined by your ability to like, make it easy to make new things. Uh, so because Gems need to exist. Uh, you need to attract people to the ecosystem. And it needs to be easy to learn and pick up. And Ruby was awesome at that. But later success is fundamentally different. We're 20 years in now, right, and post more than 10 years of Rails. People are more critical. It's an incumbent. It's not the new shiny thing anymore. People are using it at work. They need it. They, they, it's in much more serious context. And a lot of money is riding on these systems being long-term maintainable. It's a very different mindset, isn't it? Um, and so later success for languages, you look at something like Java, I would say it's based on whether you're able to make it easy to maintain old stuff. And I really don't feel like Ruby's ever excelled at that. And so my challenge in writing this talk was to ask myself, is there anything that we can do as a community to make it easier to maintain old Ruby code? And I thought about it, and I thought that the best way to like, think about that, to pull that thread, would be to let's refactor some legacy code, because that's, that's the context in which I think most teams struggle. Um, so if you're not familiar with terms, the word refactor uh, is a verb defined by Martin Fowler as to change the design of code without changing its observable behavior. Uh, th that's a great definition. I'll add to some purpose to it by saying, typically I refactor to change code in advance of the bug fix that I want to make or the feature that I want to implement so that the job of doing that is easier. It's like pre-factoring. It's getting the system in so that I can slot that new feature in later. Uh, the other term here, legacy code, uh, isn't well defined, has a lot of definitions. Some people just use it to mean old code that they, uh, may maybe code that doesn't have tests. Michael Feather's definition is code that doesn't have tests, or code that we don't like. Uh, but today, my definition is a little bit more specific. It's, I say legacy code is code that we don't understand well enough to change with confidence. And whether you have tests or not, uh, uh, that's, that's, I think, the one that, that, that best discriminates what it's like to maintain old stuff. So today we're going to talk about refactoring some legacy code. Uh, you know, 
If you're here, you're gonna talk about refactoring, you probably know refactoring is hard. Uh, I think refactoring legacy code is really hard and what makes it really hard is it's easy to accidentally break unrelated functionality because there's so many variables, so many branches, so much complexity all tangled up. And as a result, most of us view legacy code refactors as a fundamentally unsafe thing to do um, and no fun. Additionally, they're, they're hard to sell to people. Um, the way to, I'd visualize that is a little two axes graph, a business priority on one axis and the cost and risk of implementation on the other axis. In the top right, you could say our new feature development, right? They're very important, but they're also expensive. And in the top left, you draw bug fixes, also important to the business, but relatively less expensive. Bottom left, I'd probably put testing, certainly less important than those two. Um, obviously important to us, but also not so expensive that the business doesn't let us do it. And what goes in the bottom right? Well, if I had to put it anywhere, I'd put refactoring in that corner, right? It's very expensive and it's of nebulous business priority. So we don't have to sell our businesses on, on letting us build new features. That's probably why they're paying us a salary in the first place. And it's probably not gonna be hard to sell them on bug fixes. Uh, testing used to be hard to sell, but it's become normalized culturally now in software, and so typically we, we're, we're afforded time to do it. But it's still really hard to sell people on refactoring and habitually paying down the technical debt in our projects. Um, you think about why it's hard? I mean, it's because we can't necessarily predict how long a refactor is gonna take us. Uh, from the business's perspective, we just said that the definition of refactoring is you're not changing the observable behavior. So if you spend a month refactoring something, they're not gonna tell if you were fleecing them or not. Uh, and, just, and just playing video games. So, so it takes a lot of trust. And additionally, the, the areas that need the most refactoring tend to be all tangled up. Uh, and so as a result, when we're refactoring a particular area in our code, it's not safe for other people to be working there. We have to stop everything uh, so that we can merge it in, otherwise you'll have all sorts of merge conflicts. And so it's very uh, disruptive to do a lot of refactoring. And what you notice is like that complexity is correlated with importance. So like the m more complexity in any bit of code, the more branches and conditions and everything else that you've gotten like thrown in there, it didn't get there by accident. It got there because it was really important to the business that it cover all of those cases. And so the things that need the most refactoring are also things that we're most afraid to change. Um, so if you think about, sure, it's down there. It's, 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 it's relatively low priority because it's so hard to sell. What could we do to make Refactoring a better sell to the business is the first thing we should think about. Like, how could we raise the priority? Because in their minds, uh, you know, refactoring feels like road construction. We're telling them they're going to get less of what they need more slowly, but money is going to continue to fly out the door at the same velocity that it normally does. Uh, and we have a few strategies for dealing with it. None of them good. Uh, first, we can try to scare them. We can say, hey, well, if we don't refactor, then someday we'll need to rewrite everything. Uh, and that's far in the future. That's too nebulous or your maintenance costs will be higher. And, then, and that doesn't help because it's hard to quantify, right? The next thing people do is they try to absorb the cost of refactoring as part of their just, you know, every story. Like for instance, in this little pie chart, we probably spend some amount of time planning, some amount of time doing development, and some amount of time testing. Well, the team could just agree, like for every single card, we're gonna grow the pie and add habitual refactoring, and we're gonna do refactoring as part of every single story. And that would be fantastic, except it requires extreme discipline, which probably means it doesn't scale and it won't work on every team. And additionally, if the team is ever under any kind of time pressure, which is most teams, it's gonna be the first practice that goes out the window. So I don't think that's gonna be successful. The most common thing I see as a consultant is the strategy to take hostages. So the business is like, hey, I've got feature one, two, three, and four, and I want them in this order. And then we say, au contraire, sir, you're not gonna get feature two until we pay down this technical debt. And you're not gonna get feature three until we pay down that technical debt. And I don't like this because it's adversarial, right? It blames the business for having rushed us in the first place. Additionally, did you know that software developers are like highly paid and expensive to businesses? So it erodes their trust in us if we tell them that this thing that we just built them six months ago was actually shoddy junk and we need to go fix it. And if we get in the habit of telling them that, eventually they're going to probably find new developers. Uh, so yeah, refactoring is hard to sell. Uh, this is not a talk about figuring out how to solve that problem, because I haven't yet. Uh, uh, I think that uh, there's a lot that we could do, but a lot of it's also cultural. So let's just give up on that for now. <laughs> and let's talk about the other axis, cost and risk. Why is it so costly and risky? Well. From a developer's perspective, it's a lot of pressure to do refactoring, right? You have to keep a lot in your head. It's really scary, the scariest, darkest, dankest 
base, basement of the code base. Uh, you feel like you're under a lot of time pressure because you know, getting any sort of allowance to spend the time on this stuff can be difficult like we just talked about. And the tooling isn't really that great. Like most open source tooling and libraries are written by people who, who don't want to be thinking about the legacy mess that they have. They were, it's like about creating new stuff. That's where most of our attention goes. We don't think of it as being 80% of our job even though it probably is. Uh, so the tools aren't that great. And so that makes refactors feel really scary. And if I'm on any kind of mission, if there's any theme to the work that I've been doing uh, in my career, it's to try to find all the scariest things about dealing with the complexity of software development and somehow make them less scary so that I can be productive. Uh, if you're on board with that message, I think that you should buy my book. Uh, working on a book for a few years, it's called The Frightened Programmer. <laughs> uh, that is a joke. I am uh, way too afraid to write a book, so. That book does not exist. Uh, let's talk about what we can do to make refactoring a little bit less costly. Well, the first thing that we already have is the book Refactoring Patterns and, and that sort of approach, where what they do is they define a, a handful of operations like extract method, pull up, push down, or split loop refactors. And these are uh, safe operations that we can do in our code, uh, but they're made safer when we have like good tools through language introspection, like static analysis in Java. Like my favorite thing about using Eclipse IDE with Java is I have this right click menu and I can do all these things and I'm basically guaranteed safety because all the references can be matched uh, and I don't have to spend all day gripping around for, for the changes I wanna make. Um, I can't do that in Ruby. But even if I could, these sorts of operations aren't expressive enough for me to radically redesign stuff. I can move things around and make things a little bit better, but I don't think that refactoring patterns in and of themselves are enough of uh, a solution. Characterization testing for, for refactors, making refactoring easy, was, was pioneered by uh, Michael Feathers in his seminal book, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. I'm sure a lot of us have seen this. It was published in 2004. But basically all it says is that treat your legacy code like it's a black box and then put a little test harness around it. Write a test just for that black box of code, and then just pass arguments to it. And then listen to what the result is back, and write a test that locks that in with an assertion. And then do it again, and do it again, and pass in different arguments to try to cover every single case that you might anticipate, and lock it all in with a whole bunch of assertions. And there's no wrong answers. If you find a bug or a weird return value, you might make a note or file an issue, but like the goal here is to just crystallize the current behavior of the code and not try to jump ahead to fixing stuff. And once you have that, that black box becomes uh, transparent enough. You can, you can go in, you can be as aggressive as you want. You can delete it all if you want. And you could refactor new units that you do understand that you would be able to change with confidence. And then you backfill those with unit tests that like, actually you know, express the intent of how you want that system to work. Whereas the characterization test has no clue of that. But you know what, that's a lot of testing. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of sunk cost, especially because the next step after you've done all this is to blow away those characterization tests uh, because they don't understand how the system is supposed to work. And if you were to keep them around, they'd be like an albatross just holding you back and increase the carrying cost of the code. But if you're a team that has a lot of legacy code, you probably don't have a lot of code coverage. Uh, so you look at that, it's really hard to let go of those characterization tests because you just finally saw your code coverage statistic go up and now Justin's telling you to go and delete all those things and you're gonna see it go down again, that's depressing. And the other thing I've seen a lot of teams that try to do characterization testing, they fall into this trap of only half finishing this stuff. So you end up with a whole bunch of characterization tests that they come to rely on, but they never actually follow through with fixing anything uh, and just adds to the nine hour build process of semi quasi integrated tests. Uh, so, so that's, it's, it's very helpful, but it's not perfect. The third approach I see people use is akin to A-B testing, or maybe we've learned it from A-B testing. Basically, you got the old code over here, uh, you write some new implementation of code, and then you put a router in front of it. And you say 20% of the time we're gonna go to the new code, 80% of the time we're gonna go to the old code. Uh, and uh, that you can like limit the amount of damage the new code can do because you're just releasing it to some small group of people. Uh, GitHub has written a gem called Scientist that's like an A-B testing tool, but specifically for this kind of experimental activity. Um, and you know, I think it's great. Some concerns I have are it doesn't answer any questions about how to do that big rewrite. You know, it's moving in a very big step and that can be you know, difficult to figure out everything that it would need to do and how it would have to behave. And you need to have very sophisticated monitoring and analysis to be able to understand what is happening to those users who are using the new code path. Uh, which not a lot of us have. And finally, you have to be working in a business domain where it's safe for some users to just have a terrible experience, like on GitHub. Uh, so, 
it just goes down a lot, right? Like, and that's fine. I'm not, I'm not kidding. If it was like a financial transaction, that wouldn't be appropriate. If it was like a healthcare thing, that wouldn't be appropriate. So GitHub is safe to experiment with. And some of our domains are that way, and if yours is, then you can use that sort of approach. Um, but, but it's not gonna work for everybody. All right, so if you view that as like a spectrum with characterization testing on the left, A-B experiments on the right, you know, you can see this weird divide where Working effectively with legacy code is great in development, a little bit painful in testing, has almost no advice about what to do about staging in production. Something like scientists or the A-B testing approach doesn't tell you how to develop that new thing or test it locally. Um, it might be really useful in, in a staging environment where you can experiment and see how things are working. Uh, it might be a little overwhelming in a production environment, but it answers those questions much better, obviously. And so thinking about this talk when I submitted this abstract, I was thinking like, what if one tool could just give me a good development story, a good testing story, a good staging story, and a good production story, and kind of carry me through the entire life cycle of a refactor? Because I'm not scared at just any one of those stages. I'm scared of all of the stages of a big refactoring, and I want something to just carry me through the whole thing. And I was thinking like, what would that tool look like? Does it exist? And I did a lot of research, and I did a lot of thinking, and then I did a lot of procrastinating, and then nine months passed, and then I was like, oh crap, I have to give a talk on this. And <laughs> And I thought, like, I could just give, like, a standard issue Justin Searle's talk of 700 snarky slides that say, like, how I think things should be done. But then I had this cool idea that was like, hey, I could just write a Ruby gem <laughs> that, that actually helped people. Uh, and so I did that. Instead of just writing a whole bunch of snarky slides, uh, I uh, practiced this. Uh, uh, you might be familiar with this particular methodology called TDD. So I used TDD to build this uh, a, a gem that we're going to talk about for the rest of the talk. Uh, if you're not familiar, TDD stands for Talk Driven Development, uh, <laughs> where you submit abstracts that then commit you to massive amounts of work. Uh, and what check out the other end of this is a gem that we call Suture. Uh, uh, so uh, it's up on GitHub under Testables, or you can find it there. Uh, that's what GitHub looks like. Uh, you can install it with gems. That's how you install a gem. And the, the metaphor here is that refactors can be treated like surgeries. Uh, so, so the similarities are, you know, surgeries try to solve these intractable problems to make us feel better. Um, they require careful upfront planning. They, they, they leverage these tools that are very different and used differently in different contexts. Uh, just like we want to use this in these different like environments and these different modes of thought for development. They follow very clear processes, not for an arbitrary reason, but because there's so much variation, there's so many distractions that following a clear process can help you understand uh, you know, like what makes a particular situation unique. And they have a plan for like long-term observation. Obviously, while you're under the needle, you got a whole bunch of people looking at everything. But then in your follow-up checkup, it's like a little bit stepped back, and then you might have years of, of, of other follow-up that's just like, you know, uh, uh, like a lower resolution measurement that everything is okay and safe and successful. Uh, of course, like, like, like surgeries, refactors can get pretty bloody too. I mean, like it's, uh, uh, it, 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 things, things can get messy, and it's a way to control things that get messy. So, Suture, the way it works is there's kind of like nine features uh, that we're going to talk through that are each there to help you out through this particular workflow and hold your hand. The first step, we plan out the, the, the refactor, and then we, we cut what is called a seam in the code uh, that is a, like a, a call site to the legacy code. Then we record all the interactions that pass through that seam, the, the arguments passed in, the results that are returned. We validate those recordings against uh, the old code to make sure we can replay them back, that the recordings are valid. Then we can refactor as aggressively as we like uh, into a new implementation, which we can then verify by, by replaying the new implementation against the same recordings, so like locally we're pretty confident. Once we get up to staging, because we've got all this stuff configured, we can actually just run through in a staging environment the same critical path of code, the old stuff and the new stuff side by side, like a double entry accounting, and if either side differs at all in how they react, then we throw up an error and explain what just happened. And we can use that same configuration then in production. So if anything blows up in an unexpected way, we can fall back from the new path to the old path so that users are not interrupted by our mistaken or, or buggy refactors. Finally, when we're confident everything's done, suture is meant to be deleted. We, we pull it out and then we just point everything to the new code path and you can call the refactor complete at that point. So that's the process. And the first we're gonna talk about how to plan. So uh, today we're gonna have two example bug fixes. Uh, first. Uh, we're gonna have a silly little calculator service. You know, like, forgive it, but like all these code examples are very contrived for the purpose of, of clarity. Uh, this calculator service is supposed to be able to add numbers, but it doesn't add negative numbers correctly. Uh, it's the, an example of a pure function. Pure functions are always easier to deal with, right, because you pass in arguments, you get a return value. Uh, so 
here we instantiate a new calculator. We call add with a left operand and a right operand. We assign it to an IVAR. If you look at the implementation of this add method, uh, it's defined here, and then for the number of times the right thing is, we add one to the left, uh, which of course that's where our bug is, right? Because we're always adding and not subtracting. You're probably looking at this being like, that's really ugly code. Well, you know what? Your legacy code's really ugly, so <laughs> deal with it. Okay, so, so our seam is obviously right here. We're calling, we're calling add there, so that's where we're gonna be introducing suture later. The second bug, is that we also have this tally service, which, which is stateful, which means we're having a side effect. It doesn't handle odd numbers correctly. And this is, we're gonna call this the mutation case. And if you look at this one, it's a, it spins up a new calculator, loops over some number of parameters in, in, in some collection, uh, and then for each of them calls tally on that number, and then finally assigns the result to the total of those things. And you can uh, look at this awesome implementation here of like it lazily instantiates an IVAR called total, counts down from the number, and then if it hits the halfway point exactly, doubles that and adds that to the total. Uh, so yeah, the, the, it doesn't work on odds, right? So, because these are all integers. So that's pretty cool, cool code. Uh, <laughs> Call a tally there, you call a total there, and you, you realize it's not super clean, right? So this seems more complex. We're gonna have to figure out how to cut this, and, and we'll take a look at that uh, in just a second, because now we're gonna cut these seams. Again, pure function, you're gonna see a pattern emerge here. The pure function's always easier to deal with. TLDR, write more pure functions, because uh, <laughs> they're, they're gonna come back to bite you less often. Because here, what we do is we take this code that existed, we're gonna replace the actual call to a call to suture. We're gonna say suture.create, then we name it something, we name it add. We pass in the arguments now as, a, as an array of args, and we tell it uh, this is the old code path, and we pass it the method. And this, this can be anything that responds to call, so it could be a proc or a custom class, it doesn't matter. And initially, this setup so far is a no-op. I would do this, and then I would run the code and just make sure I didn't break anything. It should continue to behave just like it normally would. It's just gonna call through by default. In the mutation case, we're gonna cut that one now. So we look at this one, and this is again, more complex. We were gonna replace the call to tally with suture.create tally, pass in the args of calc and n, which you should say, wait, what? Because calc isn't an arg. Uh, so, so let's talk about how to design these seams when, when we don't have a pure function when side effects are involved. Because uh, pure functions, they're a black box, right? So if we call add with two and eight, we're gonna get 10. And if we call it with two and eight again, we're gonna get 10. And that makes all this really easy because it's repeatable input and output. But mutation and side effects are hard, right? If we call tally with four, we get four. And if we call tally again with four, we get eight. So now, you have to consider that like, it's not an argument per se in language terms, but it effectively is that IVAR on calculator is part of the state that inf influences the behavior of the method. Uh, so what we could do is we could just logically say, all right, well, a calc with IVAR total zero uh, is the first parameter into this thing, and now I can force repeatable inputs and outputs. This is counterintuitive, and there's not very many other contexts as programmers that we have to think this way, uh, but it seems to work here in this case. So we're gonna treat that like an argument. Uh, we're broadening the seam, and that means we can't just simply delegate to tally. We have to actually write a custom proc here. And it's gonna take in the calculator, the state of the calculator, as well as the number. We're gonna call tally with the number, and then we're gonna return the total, which is something that the actual code doesn't do, because it's a void, it just returns. But we're gonna return the total here so that we can build these recordings that take in all the state that matters and then returns all the result that we care about, so the recordings are actually meaningful and useful. Speaking of recordings, here's how we set up these recordings. So with the pure function, all you gotta do is add to the configuration, record calls true, and it'll start recording every single call that's made to that seam. Uh, you can also, almost every single one of these options can be set up with environment variables, so if you're running Suture in a deployed environment, you don't have to make source code changes to the configuration. And to record some calls, you can just invoke it. So you could open up a Rails console, you could create a controller, set some params, call show, that's gonna record. Uh, different params, call show, that'll make a recording. Different params, call show, that'll make a recording. You wanna cover the happy cases and the sad cases. Uh, you could record via the browser if you wanted to and click on stuff and have that invoke the code. You could throw it up in production, record there and pull the snapshots down later if you'd like. Uh, that seems safe. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think it would work, I don't know. I haven't done it. Uh, uh, the mutation case, 
Uh, again, just add record calls. There's no, no extra complexity here. You know, pass in a few numbers, they're all even. You pass in some more numbers, great. You pass in one with a, like an odd and an even. You pass one in with all odds. You make sure you cover all your cases. Where does it go? Where does this get saved? Well, Suture actually just uh, on-demand instantiates a SQLite database in this path. You can set it wherever you like. And uh, it just dumps all those recordings in there, creates the database if you've deleted it or if you don't have one handy. And it uses marshall.dump. Marshall is part of Ruby standard lib, and it's a way to convert Ruby objects into uh, byte strings that are really easy to persist and then re rehydrate, reload later. At this point, you might be curious, like, does this work with active record objects? I had written sutures, like, for the last 10 days at the point that I was like, I should probably see if this works with Rails stuff. Uh, since a lot of our legacy code is Rails. Uh, so I took a look at the Gilded Rose kata. Uh, if anyone's familiar with this kata, it's a really cool exercise uh, that Jim Wyrick ported to Ruby in a, in a repo here. Uh, it's still up on, 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 on Jim's uh, uh, GitHub page. And you don't have to read this, but you can sort of see the same flow where this, this particular code takes in an item we call update quality, and then I've configured the Lambda to return the mutated item, and so that's what we're measuring there. And I made a little Rails app around it, so uh, this is a real beautiful Rails scaffold. Uh, so I'm gonna create a few items that, that are significant for the purpose of that refactor activity. Uh, they're listed in a list. And the update quality, that's where the critical path is. So I, when I click that, stuff happens, and then I check my SQLite database, and I see that they're getting recorded, and I take a look, and I rehydrate, and I make sure they're, they're good. I click it again, I make sure a few more things get in. And then, uh, yeah, so Rails apparently works, so sweet. So this all does work on Rails, I've actually tested it, and if you're interested uh, in the example directory of the repo, you can play with a Rails example based on that. Now we have to validate that these recordings can be played back in a test environment. Uh, so, so with the case of the pure function, we just write a test, and uh, uh, here I create a calculator, and then the second API that we're going to look at, suture.verify, will replay all of our recordings. So we, we name it add so that it knows which rows from its database to go look up. It has to match the production one. And then the subject is whatever, whatever thing we want to test, whatever thing we want to make sure matches up with all those recordings. And here we pass in the calculator's add method. Once we've done that, what'll happen at runtime is it's gonna verify every single recorded argument set with the recorded result, whether that was a return value or a, a raised exception. <clears throat> and you can imagine right in your head that what we basically just got was a whole bunch of disposable characterization tests. All we had to do was record, but unlike the other characterization tests, we don't have this tremendous sunk cost fallacy wanting us to keep them forever. In fact, they don't feel like tests, they're just these rows in this rando database. Uh, so, so we don't feel any sort of unnecessary sense of attachment to our characterization tests, which is one thing I really like. In the mutation case, uh, very similar here. We, we call verify with tally. Uh, here we create a lambda that behaves exactly like the production one. It should look exactly like it because we're expecting it to behave the same way. Um, and one of the fun things is, I'm not a big code coverage fan because I've seen it abused on a lot of teams and used as like a whipping metric for people. But this is actually a really useful case for code coverage because it can guide our recording activity. Uh, so if you look at the Gilded Rose Kata again, uh, here's how Jim Wyrick, like in his example repo, he did the characterization test using his RSpec given uh, 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 library. If you've never seen RSpec given, I love it. It's really, really terse. Uh, but even though it's really terse, he had to write like 240 lines of custom uh, testing. And I highly doubt he was in the mood after this was all done to like go and, and throw this test away and write more isolated tests later, right? So uh, that's not ideal. Doing the same testing, covering all the same behavior with suture.verify, it was one test. I said suture.verify rows, I passed in the subject as saying call up, update quality, return the item. Uh, I, so yeah, it's, it's actually dumping the item before it calls it and then dumping the result after it calls it. So uh, the delta is captured in every single row. And then I have an additional option here, fail fast true, when you expect all the recordings to pass so that it doesn't, you know, if something fails, it doesn't waste your time by running all the other ones. And then before I called it done, I just ran a, a simple cover report. I took a look at it and I was like, sweet, everything's covered. And if something wasn't covered, I wouldn't have to write another test. I just have to go to the website and click a button and, uh, you know, cover it that way and then run the coverage again. Uh, so this is really fun that you can get legacy code, the hardest to test stuff, 100% code coverage, writing zero custom tests. Uh, uh, which I think is pretty neat. So at this point, finally, we can refactor, right? You came to this refactoring talk, so you're like, I'm, I'm gonna learn about refactoring. Well, I have a secret. You have to not tell anyone the secret. I don't know if we can like cover the camera lens or something. Uh, the secret is I'm actually really bad at refactoring. <laughs> I don't know very much about, re all I know about refactoring is that when I'm refactoring scary code, I tend to hold my breath. Uh, and uh, sometimes I'll go hours and I'll be like, man, I'm graying out. So. <laughs> 
you now know my secret to refactoring. Uh, our friends in the community, Sandy and Katrina, they wrote this book, 99 Bottles of Oop, and it actually is like, uh, has refactoring as a very heavy emphasis. So if you do want to learn more about actual refactoring, I'd strongly recommend you check this book out. It's a cool book because unlike mine, it actually exists. Uh, so, so, so it has that going for it. In the case of the pure function, this refactor, you know, these are simple contrived examples. You look at this, the problem, right, is that it doesn't work for negative values. So we're gonna create a whole new method. This is so we can call both of them, uh, as opposed to changing the existing one. And we're going to do this clever thing where we just say left plus right uh, and to add the two things. But you know I have some extra space there because I'm gonna do something weird. Return left if right is less than zero. I'm actually re-implementing the bug and then marking it with a fix me. Because uh, remember, I want to retain the current behavior exactly, bugs and all. This is super counterintuitive, but remember, this is a separation of concerns thing. Refactoring is not about jumping in and fixing it as soon as it feels comfortable to fix it. Refactoring is about re reworking everything so that the fix can come in later, and we're not confident of that until we can be sure that it behaves exactly the same way that the old implementation did. Uh, and additionally, like, it can be really arrogant sometimes to just rush in and fix a bug without considering that some higher order caller might be depending on that buggy functionality in ways that we don't anticipate. So, so I'm all about taking my time before I actually make the fix. Now at this point, we got a backfill with real unit test. So a simple test of adding two numbers. This is a, the most fascinating slide in the whole thing. You add things and then you assert that they add successfully. Uh, and then additionally, we were at test negative adding. So, here we'll just skip that because it's not implemented yet, but obviously we want to not get through this and forget to fix the bug. Um, so, so then the mutation case, similar story, skips the odd values, we're gonna just ignore all this, write a new one where we just lazily instantiate the same IVAR, we add, and then we return, because we want it to still return nil to capture the existing behavior. But we also want to re-implement the bug, so we're gonna, we're gonna have a guard clause at the top just return if something's odd, and a, a fix me note. So, uh, Kent Beck has this, like, uh, uh, one of his most famous tweets. Uh, I don't know if he wrote this prior to Twitter, like, in a book or something. I don't read books. Uh, uh, but Kent, he said, uh, uh, you know, make the change easy. Warning, this may be hard. And then make the easy change. So that's the mindset with which we're coming to this. Again, write some unit tests. So you, you call the tally a couple times. Make sure two and four total up to six. Uh, and then a skip pending test for the odd one. All right, so we've refactored our code. Now we gotta verify that the new code paths can be played back against the original recordings. So in the pure function case, we're gonna test it out, create a calculator, call suture verify add, pass in the subject calculator method new add. Remember, you gotta call the new one. I made this mistake like the first couple of times. I was like, sweet, it works, but I was calling the old one from the new test. Uh, and great, that works. Uh, that one just passes. Now the mutation case, where everything is more complicated, isn't going to. We're gonna call this uh, with tally, we're gonna create that same lambda again, again, being sure to call the new implementation. Uh, and this one fails, this one blows up, uh, WTF. So another thing uh, that the late, great Jim Weirich uh, imparted on me when I was writing one of my first gems, he said, Justin, like, the most important thing any library can do is provide really excellent thorough error, me error messages to its users to, to, tell, to help tell them like, how, to, how, how to respond to exceptional cases. Uh, so this is the error message that you get. Instead of scrolling through a long test, you're actually scrolling through essentially a customized markdown readme of what to do next uh, whenever any of your verifications fail. Uh, and so we're gonna break this down. First, you get a list of all of the failures that occurred uh, in that run. Then, if you look at any of those individual failures, it'll show you the arguments as well as the expected and actual return values or error results. And uh, a couple little things to help you out when you're, when you're practicing, when you're running these things, you can, you can set a flag to only run that failure and just focus on that one. And if you decide that a particular recording is erroneous and you can disregard it, then an API in Suture to delete just that particular recording so that it doesn't show up again. Additionally, we give advice about how to deal with these failures. So, at the bottom of all the failure lists, uh, it'll talk a little bit about like, hey, maybe the problem is in the comparison of the arguments and the results, like maybe those aren't matching up. Um, so talk about how we compare these results. Uh, Suture ships with a default comparator. Uh, it's real simple. It compares these things with equals. Uh, I think that would normally work, but not always when you're dumping stuff out. So it has a backup plan of, of comparing their Marshall dump byte strings, and if those match up, uh, then it considers them to be equivalent. Uh, for active record, it smells out if it thinks that these things are active record objects and it'll compare the attributes hashes, uh, less uh, updated at and created at, and you can actually add additional columns you'd like to ignore on, on a per seam basis. Um, 
But if you're using the default comparator and your thing doesn't equal the other thing for whatever reason and, and you get stuck, you can implement a custom comparator. Uh, so like, let's suppose just hypothetically that this calculator that we're working on has these other fields on it uh, that we don't really care about for the purpose of equivalency, uh, so, and, and that the subject actually returns the calculator, so we're comparing two calculators with each other. Well, the comparator would simply like pass in, you, we've all written sort of comparison logic, the recorded one, the actual one, and we would just return uh, you know, true if the totals match up, because the total is what we care about. Um, classes uh, in Ruby are also a thing. Uh, so if you don't like writing a lot of anonymous lambdas, you can implement this as a class. Uh, you can actually extend from Suture's default comparator, which means that when you implement call, you can just return true if the default comparator is successful. Otherwise, fall back on whatever your custom comparator logic is. Then to the, to the seam, you just pass in uh, an instance of, of whatever your comparator was. So going back to that error message, a couple more things that show up in here is all, by default, Suture runs all of your tests in random order, because uh, that, that seemed like a good thing to do. Um, if, if you can't, if, if you have one that happens because of the random order, you get some order dependency, you can lock to a particular seed uh, by setting that environment variable there. And if you know that you have to run the test for some reasons in an insertion order and in, in the order that they were recorded in, you can just set that seed to nothing, to nil. Additionally, I wanted to make the configuration as discoverable as possible. Uh, so, so you can see here, uh, this is the comparator, the database path, uh, fail fast is set to false. You can actually limit how many tests it runs and how, how much time you're willing to, like I'll, I'll just run for five minutes, I don't want it to go for hours if you have a lot of database stuff. You can limit the number of error messages it prints out and we talked about the seed. The goal here too is like a lot of times we're not just refactoring, we're re-implementing something. And, I, and when you're re-implementing, you're starting at zero and then you're building up. So I wanted to give people a sense of progress. Uh, I also wrote this gem years ago that I never got to use called the bar of progress. Uh, so it was an excuse to throw a progress bar in here. But it, the, it's to give you a sense that you're making forward progress. Uh, you're at 92%, this many are failing, this many are passing. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to trick our brains into thinking refactoring is fun. Um, <laughs> So yeah, uh, I, I think it's really important for libraries to have good messages. Um, so yeah, I forgot, well, why did the verification fail? Well, uh, it's actually returning nil, which is surprising, but if you look at the calculator's total, it's nil, and it's passing in one, so I think that's a hint. So if we look here, we're like, oh right, one is odd, and it's returning before we've lazily instantiated total. So we need to delete that, put that up at the top, uh, run it again, and now it all passes. So this was actually a real bug while I was making the slides that like, I got caught on. Uh, so, so that was, that was uh, uh, affirming. Now let's talk about comparing uh, the new and the old path, because remember, our mission is to make things good everywhere, and so far we've only done development and testing, we haven't really considered staging and production. And the pure function case here, all we're gonna do is add another flag called call both to true, and it's gonna call both the new and the old code paths. Uh, and in the case of the first one, it just, it just works in all cases. Uh, but if you run it actually in staging, I think you'll find like a lot of surprising inputs and outputs uh, in, in most cases. And what'll happen in staging, because it's staging, it'll just blow up with a big error message and explain exactly what just happened. Uh, in the mutation case here, we're gonna set call both to true, and like always, it's gonna be a pain, because uh, it's not gonna exactly work. It fails, we get another huge error message with as much advice as I could fit into it. Uh, and what it says there is you can see the total was two and we were called with two and the new code path returned true two, but the old code path returned four. And what's happening, of course, is the calc is being mutated, duh. So I added another option here called dupe args, the idea being to protect against arg mutation that would actually dupe the calculator before calling either of the paths. Uh, of course, I was really proud of myself and that still didn't work because now the, the calculator that actually we started with never changes and its total is always nil. So you have to do another little trick of after you've made the mutation to the thing that you're caring about, uh, do a reassignment. This is just a custom one-off thing that I had to do in this particular case. It got messy. Most legacy code doesn't have really neat seams, will have side effects, and it'll, it'll get messy. Uh, so this one worked, but you know, I didn't feel real great about myself. Uh, and you know, gotta remember, like, there's trade-offs, right? So like, these features exist to try to make this easier. If the, if the feature is making the refactor harder, then maybe it's not worth it. Uh, just take advantage of the features that are useful to you. But if you did pay that penalty to get it working in staging, you'll also get this benefit in production for free. Because Mike, the thing I care most about is making uh, my changes safe for users. The last thing I ever want to do is break stuff for users, and if the new path errors, uh, I want to rescue with the old one. So in the case of the pure function here, I just change call both to fall back on error to true. It'll rescue that new code path with, if, it, if it raises uh, with, by calling the old one. So everything's just invisible to the user. In the mutation case, I already paid the price of making this actually work when you call both paths. That means I can also just change the flag and we're golden, it'll work fine. 
Obviously, if you only call the old path when you really need to, that's going to be faster than calling them both. Uh, fewer side effects in case you're worried about, like, you know, uh, calling both things, having effects in databases and stuff. Uh, that's probably a thing you should check out before you throw this into production. Um, all the errors are logged. Sutra actually comes with a pretty sophisticated logging system. Uh, so you can configure that. You can merge it with your Rails stuff. You can just, I just recommend you keep an eye on it so that if your new code path is failing 100% of the time, you know. Uh, and, and additionally, you can configure particular error types because sometimes we expect our code to raise exceptions. Uh, so if it raises an error that you expect, you can just register that class and it won't consider it a failure. It'll, it'll let things keep passing through. All right, finally, when we're done, we just delete it. So just like stitches, we remove suture once the wound heals. In the case of the pure function, now this is the fun part, we just get to delete that test. We get to, an API here to delete all of the recordings for that, for that seam. Uh, you know, we get to sort of rip this stuff out here, the old and the args and yada yada, and we just call back to the original method. It looks just like it used to, except it's calling our new path exclusively. That feels good. In the mutation case here, uh, we blow away that test. We blow away all of its recordings. Uh, the, ugh. So it's, it's like, it's literally like ripping off a band-aid. This is the most fun part. You're like, yeah, go away. All right, be four lines again, please. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so you feel a lot better. So you, you know what? We did it. Like, that was the whole refactor. That was the whole step. That was like pretty much every feature in this thing. Uh, we should all feel really good. Note that we didn't actually fix the bugs. Uh, so, so I added this slide because I'd given this talk three times before realizing that we didn't actually fix the bugs. So it's easy to get carried away in the refactor step, I guess. Uh, so we did it, ish. Uh, Suture is ready to use. Uh, again, it's up on GitHub there. We were very careful because like, production is scary, refactors are scary enough. So we decided to uh, release this initially at 1.0. We're going to respect Sember. We're not going to make any breaking changes and surprise you. Um, additionally, I've been chatting with Michael Feathers a lot lately about uh, ways to make production refactors safer, and a big part of that is deleting dead code. He just released a new gem this week called Scythe, which lets you register probes in production that will uh, like basically like be tripwires to let you know this code is still in use, this code isn't in use, last time this code was called was X, X or Y date, uh, and to try to give your team the information it needs to justify deleting old code that isn't used anymore. Um, and all of this is part of an effort to make refactors less scary so that Ruby can be more maintainable, so that we can keep using Ruby at work for many years to come. Uh, and I, I hope that even if you don't use these tools, you'll think about this a little bit more about like maybe ways that you can contribute in the community, because I've got a feeling everyone in this room has a lot of legacy rescue experience. Um, additionally, uh, uh, Noel had this great idea. Uh, uh, Sam, Betsy, Noel, and I at lunch are going to congregate in the same kind of area, so you follow us all to lunch after this. Uh, we'd love to chat with you about testing uh, or any, I'll chat with you about anything. They'll, they've only promised the testing. Uh, we'll discuss some Ohio food over, I don't know, yesterday was really hearty, so I'm sure it'll be good. Um, there's one more thing I'd just like to say. Uh, this is my own word of thanks, my own gratitude. Uh, testable turned five this week. Uh, our... Our company, there is no way our company would exist without Ruby, without this community. I've got a lot of, I think, uh, I can't see you all, but I've got, I know, a few current and former like testable clients in the room. We've got a few testable agents in the room. Uh, uh, love all of you uh, that, like, for this awesome journey. Like the, if you told me five years ago we'd be like one of the most recognized Ruby agencies in the world, uh, I don't know what I would have done. I, w I was already like the maximum level of panicked, so I would have remained that level of panicked. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Searles. Uh, uh, you find me on Twitter. I'd like to be your friend. Uh, let me know what you thought about this talk. Uh, share it with other people. There's already a video of the version I gave in Japan online, so I'll tweet that out right away. Um, test Double, like you know, we're on a mission to fix what's broken about the world software. You can send us an email. Uh, join at Test Double if you'd like to join up. Uh, we're always interviewing you know, potential new agents who, who, who want to work with us. Um, and yeah, it, I don't know if you know any teams that have any legacy Ruby, uh, but we love working on this stuff. We love the complex problems of helping teams manage complexity. So if you know anyone, any teams that could use some help, uh, uh, shoot us a message or grab me. Um, I've got stickers and business cards, and I'd love to meet you. Uh, oh, and that's the end of my slides. So thank you. Thank you.